Well, I'd like to welcome you to the Parker Animal Chiropractic Program, and today we're going to talk about veterinary anatomy for the chiropractor, and we're starting this first module uh, with sacral pelvic anatomy. Now, if you're a veterinarian, you had all this in school, and but yet you may not know it from a chiropractic perspective. And as a chiropractor, you had all this in school too, but you just don't know it from a veterinary perspective. So what we've tried to do is blend the two professions a little bit and give both perspectives to you. And as I said, as you're a veterinarian, this is going to be a review a lot, but yet again, it's going to come out from a little bit different perspective. So hang in there with me and, and hopefully we'll have a, a good session here. Anatomic terminology uh, is gives veterinarians fits because we deal with quadrupeds and with quadrupeds we don't use words like anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, things such as that. When Sharon Willoughby went to chiropractic school and became a chiropractor and then went to veterinary school and became a veterinarian and then she started uh, working with animals and, and doing chiropractic procedures on animals she would talk she would talk about the listings the vertebral listings that she learned in chiropractic school and try to apply those to animals and she did it with human terminology so it really gives us veterinarians fits initially until we make the conversion so i've tried to underline the similarities here on this slide uh, in animals we talk about the dorsal aspect of the animal we're talking about the back well that's synonymous to the posterior aspect of a human so the posterior of your back is the same. The ventral surface, ventrum, comes from the Latin word meaning belly. So ventral means the, the, the belly of the animal or the undersurface of the animal. And this would be a synonymous or analogous to the anterior surface of the human. So later on you'll hear things like posterior ilium. Well actually what that is is a dorsal ilium. So you have, we veterinarians have to convert the words posterior to dorsal and anterior to ventral uh, to make sense to us initially but you'll get used to this after a while. I said initially it's confusing it's confusing for me as well uh, and it took time but hey I went to A&M and if I can learn it we all can learn it. Rostral means toward the nose or toward the nostril. Cranial caudal are words we use in quadrupeds. Cranial means toward the head. Caudal means toward the butt or the tail of the animal. Uh, in the, the synonymous terms in humans, superior means toward the head, and in this case, inferior means toward the feet or toward the floor. So when we talk about a PI ilium, a posterior inferior ilium, we're actually saying a dorsal caudal ilium. So you veterinarians are going to, have to maintain that terminology, but again, you'll get used to it after a while, and we'll go from there. So uh, the words cranial are synonymous with superior, and caudal is synonymous with inferior, uh, the human terms. Uh, medial lateral are the same, so no problem there. Palmar plantar are the same, uh, so no problem there. Palmar referring to uh, the undersurface of the front foot, plantar being the undersurface of back foot. Now, we typically use the word plantar for both feet, front and back, and the animals being the undersurface. Proximal uh, means toward the trunk of the animal, uh, where distal means away. So the paw would be distal to the elbow, uh, whereas the elbow is proximal to the carpus. Uh, use those terms. Superficial and deep are fairly self explanatory. Axial and abaxial uh, deal with toward the axis or away from the axis. Here's a slide showing you these terms and how they're used. Again, cranial would be toward the head or superior, caudal toward the butt or inferior. This is the posterior or dorsal surface. This is the anterior or ventral surface. Proximal toward the trunk, distal away from the trunk. These are the word palmar here, plantar here. Axial versus abaxial. If you have questions about these terms, please grab one of us in lab or get us in class and we can go over this with you. Here shows you the dog, the same thing, superior, inferior, posterior, anterior. And don't worry, you'll get used to it. Here's a cat skeleton. You can see the difference in the dog skeleton versus the cat skeleton. Dogs are made to run long distances uh, at slow speeds, loping if you can, if you will. 
uh, where a cat's not made to run very much at all. A cat's a pouncing animal. You can see the different shape of the skeletons, and we'll talk more about that as we go through this. This animal wasn't designed for running at all. This animal was designed for walking around eating. Uh, this is obviously a cow skeleton. Now here's a runner deluxe. Here's an animal that was not designed to run. This is a horse and just an amazing animal, amazing creature, uh, an amazing skeleton. We'll talk about this as we go. I found this online. This is a great picture of a horse. Uh, and whoever did this was just brilliant, showing you different musculature of the horse. And they painted this on the horse. And, and this is in your notes as well, so you can look at this in your notes. But it shows the main superficial muscles of the horse. Uh, horses don't have a, a sternocleidomastoid like we do. They have a muscle called the brachiocephalicus and the sternocephalicus. We'll talk about those muscles later. Here's a skeleton they put on this horse. and. It's amazing how still this horse must have had to stood to, to have this painted on them like this, but they did a very good job. Notice here's a cervical vertebra, thoracic, lumbar, and what we're going to spend time on this weekend is this area right here, the sacropelvic region. And one reason we start with the sacropelvic region is from a chiropractic perspective is in some cases it's harder to move these bones, but yet it's simpler to understand the listings. Uh, the most complicated area by far is the cervical spine. Uh, we'll cover that the next two modules, but in this module we're going to spend time on the sacral pelvic region. Plane to the body, just to divide the body into to parts to be a look at. Mid sagittal means to divide the body down the middle into right and left halves. Parasagittal refers to off the side, so unequal right and left halves. Transverse plane divides the body basically in half front and back, if you will, and frontal, uh, is the frontal plane versus the coronal plane uh, is, is the front and back side too, anterior, posterior for humans, or dorsal ventral for animals. Transverse, I'll show you a slide here next that shows the transverse plane, better describe that. So here we go, here's a transverse plane, kind of dividing the body into, uh, if you will, half, if there's like cut the leg in half, here's a transverse plane. This is a sagittal plane, called a median sagittal plane. This is a coronal or dorsal plane. So let's talk about the bones of the pelvis. The pelvis is actually formed by six bones. Uh, three bones fuse on each side to form the ossicoxa or the hip bone. And then the pelvis is the combination of these two halves. The two hip bones come together to make the pelvis itself. Pelvis means bowl or basin. Uh, it comes from the human terminology. Uh, the pelvis is the bowl or basin that holds all the intestinal contents in place. The three bones that make up the pelvis are the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. The ilium is spelled I-L-I-U-M, and this is significant because there is another ilium in the body. There's an I-L-E-U-M, which is part of the small intestine. Now, it is significant in the fact that if you spell it with an E, you're talking about a small intestine. If you spell it with an I, you're talking about the bone, the ilium, uh, ilium, uh, which we'll talk about next. The ilium comes from the word meaning shield. Uh, it comes from the Greek word, and, and there was a small island off the coast of Greece, the, the Isle of Ilia. You probably remember the book by Homer, the Iliad, and the soldiers of this island had these huge shields that they carried in the battle and to the Greeks that were first describing these anatomical structures using their terminology uh, the ilium looked like this Greek shield. In the canine it's oblong and elongated uh, it's sagittally oriented uh, in the dog. The equine is much more triangular and much more on a horizontal plane uh, in the or transverse plane in the equine. And you'll see this in pictures we show here in a second. Uh, there's the crest of the ilium is the cranial expansion or the superior expansion of the, of the ilium. This is called the wing of the ilium as well. So major muscles attached to the ilium, the gluteal muscles, gluteus medius and gluteus profundus do, the middle gluteal muscle and deep gluteal muscle. Uh, the medial surface of the wing uh, of the ilium uh, is there and this articulates with the sacrum. Uh, in humans, this is called the auricular surface. Uh, in animals, we don't call it that. The surface roughens with age as time goes on, and there's even, uh, we'll talk about fusion of the sacroiliac joint later on. This is a canine ilium. You see on this picture, here's the expansion, the cranial expansion, the crest of the ilium, if you will. So this bone is the ilium. 
And again, it kind of looks like a shield, you know. Again, they were the Greeks were not describing do, describing dogs, Ilia. They were describing human the human ilium. But it looks similar. I mean, there are some similarities there. Like human chiropractors can see some of the similarities between the pel the dog pelvis and the dog ilium and human ilium. It's landmarks on the coccyx are landmarks that we have to look at. One is called the tuber sacrali. The tuber sacrali is in human terminology and chiropractic terminology is called the posterior superior iliac spine. So tuber sacrali and posterior superior iliac spine are synonymous terms. Also called the dorsal iliac spine uh, in the animals. It is palpable just off midline. In the horse, it's kind of interesting, and you'll make this, you'll you'll notice this when we're to actually look at the horses in lab uh, on Sunday, and then the dogs uh, tomorrow. We're looking uh, at the dog lab. We'll show you these structures, but it's palpable. And I say tomorrow will be on Saturday. Uh, it's palpable just off midline. Uh, the tuber sacrali is. In the horse, they're very close together. The horse, this tuber sacrali is extremely close. Matter of fact, it's probably closer uh, together than the tuber sacrali are on, say, a German Shepherd or something like this. The dog, they're further apart, and I'll show you pictures of this in a minute. Dorsal and lateral to the S1 tubercle is where this is located. The S1 tubercle will be the, the dorsal uh, or posterior spinous process uh, of the first sacral vertebra. In horses, you can't palpate S1 because S1 is buried beneath this tuber sacrali. You can palpate S2. and as I go through these notes and go through these slides, I try to bold and underline areas that I know are test questions on the AVCA exam and also on our exams. So I promise you, you'll get asked this at some point. What is the first palpable sacral tubercle in the horse? And the answer is it's S2, the, the sacral tubercle of the second sacral vertebra. This tuber sacrali is a segmental contact point for adjusting what's called a PI ilium. PI ilium stands for posterior inferior ilium. And we're going to talk more about this as we go through this. The terminology segmental contact point may not be familiar with you, familiar to you, especially if you're a veterinarian. Uh, but what the segmental contact point is, it is the area of contact on the animal. So it's the segment that we contact or touch on the animal to deliver the adjustment or the thrust. We'll talk about the segmental contact point and that's different than the contact point. The contact point is a point, a part of your body that contacts the segmental contact point. Let me say that again. The contact point is a point on your body that touches the segmental contact point on the animal. So the contact point is on you the segmental contact is on the animal. Here is the tuber sacrali of a dog. In this area right here. Again, this is the ilium. Here's a tuber sacrali on a horse. Very close together. And this is why you can't palpate S1. You can palpate S2, but not S1. This is the ilium of a horse. You see it's oriented on a much more vertical plane. It's almost flat. The next structure is called the tuber coccyx, or the ventral iliac spine, or what you chiropractors call the anterior superior iliac spine. Now, if you veterinarians want to know where your ASIS is or your PSIS, uh, your PSIS you can find, which is your tuber uh, sacrali. Tonight when you go home uh, and you're getting ready for bed and you, you don't have your jamas on yet, turn around in the mirror, look in the mirror, and you'll see uh, on your backside, around your sacrum, you'll see two small little dimples uh, right there on your sacrum. Uh, and that's where the PSIS is. Uh, your ASI is if you palpate on the front of your iliac crest there, you can feel a little projection off the anterior or ventral aspect of that sacrum, oh, excuse me, that ilium, and you can feel that ASIS. This is a tuber coccyx on a dog, the ventral iliac spine or ASIS. It's a major muscle attachment for superficial gluteal muscles, external abdominal oblique, internal abdominal oblique, and also tensor fascia lata. It is a segmental contact point for AS ilium. 
again segmental contact point is a point that you touch on the animal contact point is a point on you so if I put my hand on this area of the dog my contact point would be my hand my segmental contact point is my tuber coccyx and I don't mean to, to keep reiterating this but it's important concepts and for some reason it's an area of confusion for students and so I want to bring that up here's a tuber sacrali or tuber sacrum on the horse here's a tuber coccyx on the horse this is an area that's sometimes traumatized sometimes fractured in horses and we'll talk about knock down hips and things like that later on. Next structure is the ischial tuberosity. This is the ischial tuberosity back here. This is part of the ischium. The ischium is the, uh, another bone of the pelvis. There's the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. The ischial tuberosity in humans is basically if, if you sit on a hard chair and kind of grind your bottom into that chair uh, you'll feel that bone beneath the gluteus maximus muscle and that is your tuber uh, ischii or ischial tuberosity. It's attachment point for the hamstring muscles. It's a segmental contact point for adjusting AS ilium. We'll talk about that. Tuber sacral, or excuse me, the tuber ischii or ischial tuberosity. They're an important landmark and pretty easy to palpate on both dogs and horses. Here shows you the ilium. Here's the pubis. Here's the ischium. There's the ischial tuberosity of the, of the canine. There's also an important structure that connects this ischial tuberosity called the sacro tuberous ligament, which we'll talk about, which goes basically from the ischial tuberosity up to the sacrum both in horses and in dogs. Not in cats, but in horses and dogs. The pubis or pubic bone, pubic symphysis, is where the two halves of the pelvis join. It does provide attachment for the rectus abdominis muscle. Uh, the pubic symphysis is there, and obviously in, in female animals, uh, the pubic symphysis undergoes diastasis when there's a separation of the pubic symphysis during the birthing process. There's the obturator foramen, which is formed by the ischium in the pubis. And then the acetabulum. Some say acetabellum. I don't care if you say acetabellum or acetabulum. Uh, again, uh, I have to spell these words. So if I say it more like it's, it, I can spell it if I say acetabulum. Acetabellum is hard for me to spell. So uh, it's just kind of maybe it's just a dumb Aggie in me. But it's formed by all three bones: the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. It forms a socket portion of the ball and socket joint that we call the hip joint. Here's a lateral radiograph of a dog showing here's a tuber sacrali right here. And it's hard to see, but here's the, the tuber coccyx down here. Here's a great picture of, of a dog pelvis showing you the distance here and the width of the tuber sacrali. Where's the tuber coccyx down here? Here's the obturator foramen, there's the ischial tuberosity, and there's the acetabulum right there. Ossification of the pelvis, as I said, the pelvis starts out as three bones. It develops by endochondral ossification. All three bones unite by one year in the equine. All three bones unite by six months in the dog. Secondary ossification centers uh, are closed by five years in the equine and by two years in the dog. Now, I'm a small animal practitioner, so I want to tell you that most of my lectures will tend to be more heavily weighted uh, towards small animals than the equine. I think one of the advantages of this program is that you as the chiropractor get to work with the veterinarians and get to work with both large and small animal veterinarians. I strongly recommend that you befriend the large animal veterinarians that are in, the, in your class and that you ask them questions about the horse, uh, especially questions that I can't answer, also the other instructors on the program uh, who know horses much better than I do. So again, I'm going to be a little heavily oriented toward dogs uh, and cats than I am horses and cows, but you'll get the other side of this as well from the other instructors and also from the classmates that you have. One of the reasons that we don't radiograph dogs for 
definitive hip dysplasia and things such as this is because the pelvis is not fully formed to two years of age. So we don't radiograph them before two years of age for this reason. So if you ever hear someone say you know, about OFA or pen certification in dogs for hip dysplasia, and hip dysplasia is a malformation or a malgrowth of the hip joint, the coxofemoral joint in dogs, and this is not confirmed, a dog's not confirmed to be hip dysplasia free until after two years of age. And the reason for that two years of age is because that's the time that these bones are fully fused, uh, that the hip's fully formed, and that we can, at that point we can say the dog is either hip dysplasia free or has hip dysplasia. So and we'll talk about hip dysplasia as we go through this course as well. The sacrum, the sacrum is formed by the fusion of the sacral segments, the sacral vertebra. The number of sacral segments or sacral vertebrae varies from animal to animal. Uh, humans have five sacral segments that fuse into one structure called the sacrum. Dogs have three. Uh, there's three sacral segments that fuse. Uh, they fuse by six months of age in the dog. Horse and, and, and cows have five segments that fuse, and they fuse by about four years of age. Goats, sheep, and hogs have four segments. Now you can see one of the problems that you, the chiropractor, are going to have to deal with uh, that we veterinarians just dealt with from the day we started school was that all the different species of animals and the variances that we deal with. Uh, it, it's pretty easy when you deal with just one animal. And as a, a medical doctor or a chiropractor, uh, you deal with one animal, the human. Yet in veterinary medicine, we deal with every other animal except humans. So all the other animals in the animal kingdom fall under the purview of the veterinarian. And so, sometimes, uh, I'm sure my colleagues are the same here, I have to stop thinking, what animal am I talking about? You know, what animal are we dealing with here? And I've kind of switched gears and think about that. I think it's very easy for a veterinarian to switch gears and go from animal to animal because that's how we're initially trained. Uh, one of the struggles the chiropractor has is making those changes, uh, changing from human to animal and in which animal you're talking about. So it creates a little quandary for the chiropractor uh, that they're not quite used to because, again, you just learned one animal in school. Sacral canal is basically where uh, the caudal equina resides. Part of the caudal equina resides inside the sacral canal. Uh, it varies from animal to animal where the spinal cord ends and the caudal equina begins. Uh, in humans, the spinal cord ends around the L1, L2 vertebra, and the caudal equina is distal to that point or inferior to that point. Uh, that's not true for animals. Uh, it varies between cats and dogs and horses and things, and we'll talk about that more later on. Uh, the base or cranial end of the sacrum is the superior or cranial end, the base is. Uh, this is a very important segmental contact point for what's called a sacral base posterior. Sacral base posterior, basically the sacrum has fixated or rocked in a posterior or dorsal direction. This is fairly common subluxation, especially in dogs. Well, the I guess first impressions I made or first impressions was made upon me uh, in adjusting animals was adjusting a, a sacral base posterior in a dog uh, and taking care of this dog's urinary incontinence and basically the story started out I was uh, had a mobile practice at this time and I was seeing a lady's German Shepherds. Uh, she had two German Shepherds, both females, both spayed, uh, both older dogs, six, seven years of age. And I'd stop by her house. So she'd call me in to, to do routine uh, vaccinations, routine exams. And she said, uh, by the way, while you're here, she said uh, one of the dogs, one of the Shepherds, uh, was leaking urine. And she said, is there anything you can do about this? And of course, my first response was, uh, you know, do a urinalysis, and, and then if that came back clear, I put the dog on proin. Proin is a drug called phenylpropanolamine. Uh, it tightens the the internal or the uh, the smooth muscle uh, internal urethral sphincter uh, and helps decrease urinary incontinence in these spayed females. It's due to uh, low estrogen levels, hypoestrogenism in these bitches, and basically uh, these dogs leak urine when they sleep. But I just learn my newfound skill of animal chiropractic so I asked her if I could adjust her dogs and she said what is that well then I began to explain to her what chiropractic was and what adjusting dogs were and she said I don't care whatever you want to do doc you know you're the doc so I adjusted this dog as opposed to uh, putting it on proin and 
really didn't think much more about it. Uh, she called me about three days later and said, Doc, she says, I just want to let you know uh, that, you know, her pup and I, I can't remember this dog's name, please forgive me, but she said that her, her pup had not been leaking urine since I adjusted it. And she said that even her husband had noticed there was an increased uh, activity level. This dog felt better. She was jumping in the, in the in their car now, which she hadn't been doing for a while, and uh, she was playing more frequently. Uh, so I was quite impressed with that, and I thought, well, that's pretty good. So uh, all these dogs who present with urinary incontinence, uh, they're not all solved by this problem by adjusting the sacrum, but yet a lot are. So I highly recommend that when you get these dogs in the clinic that have urinary incontinence, you know, check their sacrum. Uh, and, and adjust the sacrum and see if that doesn't help and doesn't stop it. At least it keeps them off the drugs uh, and it's also you know better for the dog to have to take all the medication. One of the goals we have in this course is to teach you things on the weekend that you can go back to your clinic uh, on Monday morning and practice them. Matter of fact, we strongly, strongly encourage you to practice these different techniques uh, starting Monday as soon as you return back to practice because if you don't practice these you'll never learn to do them number one number two you'll never gain proficiency in these you'll never gain the skills you need to be a good adjuster uh, and you never know what may work and again if we can keep the dogs off drugs and off medications it's much easier for the dog uh, and much better on their system their metabolism their system not to be on the medications uh, so for sure try these procedures so uh, when you go back Monday morning palpate around see if you can find some sacral base posteriors on these dogs and adjust them and we'll, we'll go over how to do that uh, during lab dog lab so this is a segmental contact point for sacral base posterior you palpate it between the two tuber sacrali and what you'll notice, there's a loss of the divot. There's normally a little divot or depression between the two tuber sacrali, both in the horse uh, and on the dog. And when that sacrum uh, basically fixates or rotates or rocks, if you will, posterior, uh, you lose that divot. Now, how do you tell if the divot is present or absent uh, on the dog? Well, it helps if you've palpated the dog before, so you, you know you have a comparison to go on. And again, it's, it's, it's partially just doing it in skill and knowing what normal feels like versus what abnormal feels like. Uh, palpate all the dogs you can. Uh, palpate as, as many as you can in, in many different sizes. And that's one of the challenges in veterinary medicine is a tremendous variance of sizes of these animals. Uh, some, you know, you've got Great Danes, you've got Chihuahuas, you've got draft horses, you've got race horses, uh, you've got Shetland ponies, you've got miniature ponies, you've got all sorts of sizes, and we'll try to provide a variance of size of animals for you, both in the equine and in the canine labs, so you can feel these different structures. And during canine lab and also equine lab, make sure you palpate these these animals, feel what normal feels like, and then find an abnormal na animal and compare those two. Learn to palpate. Palpation is a skill. Uh, it's, a, it's a talent. It's something you develop. And you've got to practice it. You've got to practice, practice, practice. You really do. Uh, I will tell you that we veterinarians are pretty rough palpators. Uh, we tend to palpate deep and rough and hard. And something that took me a long time to learn was to palpate like a chiropractor. Chiropractors palpate much more lightly. Uh, they're, they're all about light feel and light touch. And what you find over a period of time is you can actually feel more by palpating lightly than you can by palpating very deep and very rough. So work on your palpation skills and try to get that down. Remember that the first palpable sacral tubercle in horses is S2. Uh, you can palpate S1 in dogs pretty, pretty easily. Here is the sacrum of a horse. This articulates with the ilium right here. And there's that first palpable sacral tubercle in the horse, S2. You can't feel S1. Sacral promontory is on the cranial ventral aspect of S1. It's internal. You won't be able to feel it. The sacral apex is on the, the inferior or caudal aspect of the sacrum. It is a segmental contact point for what's called sacral apex laterality. You, have a, you can have a sacral apex lateral right or sacral apex lateral left. Interesting little tidbit here as, as I see a fair number of sacral apexes, lateral or lateralities in dogs with anal gland problems. Uh, also, dogs who won't let you lift their tail uh, to take their temperature or to express their anal glands, who, who 
fight you with that. Uh, show dogs like Basenjis and, and Huskies and Malamutes who won't hold their tail up. The owner will present and say, uh, my dog won't pick his tail up. My dog's dropped his tail. Remember, these dogs hold their tail up high up over their back end. Uh, think about sapex uh, laterality with the uh, or apex sapex sacral apex laterality with these. As a side note, these vodcasts, these these recordings are done in our offices, and it's a much different technique to lecture to a computer screen than it is to lecture to a group of, of, of an audience of students and to maintain you know focus sometimes in my office looking at my computer screen is is, is difficult so if I had those fall pause and things please forgive me uh, I'm doing the best I can trying to get this is maintain some you know liveliness of lecture here and maintain some type of of energy levels uh, talking to this dumb computer screen anyway back to this so the wings the articular surface of the sacrum it's attached to the psoas muscle in the equine uh, there's an oval surface for articulation with a transverse process of l6 this is called the intertransverse joint uh, dogs don't have this intertransverse joint uh, and we'll talk more about that, in just especially when we talk about the lumbar spine later on. But there's actually an adjustment for this intertransverse joint that we'll teach you later. I know I'm saying later for a lot of things, but hey, this is the first module. We just started, right? It does articulate with the ilium. The sacral tubercles, again, S2 is the strongest and the highest in the horse. Here's a great view of, of a horse's sacrum and pelvis. Here's the sacrum of the horse. Here's the pelvis. You see this vertical orientation. Here's a tuber sacrali, see how close they are together. Here's a tuber coccyx. Here's a tuber ischii. Here's the obturator foramen. There's the acetabulum to articulate with the head of the femur. The croup or crop of the dog is the, the angle here of the sacrum. The croup angle varies between breeds. In this Doberman breed, you can see this is almost vertical with the ground right here. Or in a German Shepherd, there's much more slope to the croup. A normal German Shepherd posture and stance would be considered abnormal for other breeds. Uh, you can see how straight line this back of this Doberman is, how straight the croup is, how angulated, how far slung out the hips are, and how angled this croup is in the Shepherd. You can see definitely see the slope here, slope here. The rounded back to slope again. This this is this is what predisposes these shepherds to such hip problems. It really predisposes a lot of hip problems, a lot of strain on their hips, a lot of rear end knee issues in these type dogs. And one of the challenges for you as a chiropractor is to learn a lot of these musculoskeletal challenges these different breeds have, and these different breeds face. The veterinarians, we've dealt with this since we began school. They talked to us about gait analysis and these different gaits, these different musculoskeletal problems that these different breeds have. So it's more ingrained in us, but you chiropractors need to understand these too, especially when you're adjusting these animals. Notice how straight the stifle is in these chows. Uh, this very, very straight stifle very flat croup here and some of these animals have a more angulated croup. It's very straight stifle, very straight hock. Predisposes these problems to a lot of knee issues and a lot of ankle issues. Well, so this is a chow, so it's got issues anyway. Ease of palpation these dogs depends a lot on the fur coat and also the amount of fat the dog has. If all of our dogs were greyhounds and whippets and Italian greyhounds and, and these type breeds, and boy, our life would be easy. These guys are great to palpate. You can feel every single bone on these bodies and every single muscle. The real thin skin. These are great athletes, phenomenal runners. You see this rear end is designed to drive this dog forward. This front end is designed to steer. This rear end is designed for power. You can see the angle of the croup here on this dog. Very angulated croup. As opposed to this dog, which is very difficult to palpate, a lot of extra skin, a lot of very, very thick fur, just folds and folds of skin. Much more difficult to palpate this dog than is this dog. So it takes a lot of practice on these dogs to be able to palpate these structures. Uh, you chiropractors will battle with this primarily uh, because your, your patients, your human patients, are not covered with thick hair coats like this. Lumbosacral region, lumbosacral junction, uh, back there. 
We talk about the zygapophyseal joints. The zygapophyseal joints are the joints present between the articular processes of the different vertebra. They are flat plane gliding type of joints. So these joints between the lumbar vertebra and back to the sacrum are flat plane gliding type of joints. They have a sagittal orientation. We're going to talk a lot about the facet angles. The angles of the facets on these articular surfaces of these articular processes of the vertebra. And the reason that we're going to talk about these is because this will dictate your line of correction or line of drive. Now you chiropractors know what that is. The veterinarians are saying, my what? Well, line of correction or line of drive, to sim just simplistically put, is the direction you're pushing this bone. So it's the direction you're trying to drive this bone. It's the direction you're driving the bone in order to, to adjust it or to deliver your adjustment. Stop a, second, second, stop a second and think. If you're moving a fixated bone, you need to move along the facet angles parallel to the facet angles that's going to facilitate your moving this bone if you move perpendicular or not along the facet angles then you're jamming facets and you're causing pain and you won't get the bones to move we'll discuss this more later on with you but just throw some concepts out again this is the first module you got a lot to learn a lot to cover and so I'm gonna throw a lot at you that I haven't probably explain very well yet but I'm telling you these things so that when you hear them again at least you've heard them initially okay so that's what we're talking about subluxations can cause pain obviously discomfort and we'll talk about this the intervertebral joint the joint present between the adjacent vertebral bodies is not a synovial joint it's a secondary cartilaginous symphysis type of joint what's called an amphiarthrosis now it is not a freely movable joint like your synovial plane gliding joints or the zygapophyseal joints. The and the zygapophyseal joints, the bony surfaces slide on top of each other. Okay, there's a synovial membrane, there's synovial fluid, there's articular cartilage, so there's free movement of these joints. These intervertebral joints, there's no free space there between the bones. The bones are joined directly by these fibrocartilaginous discs. And so what, how the intervertebral joints move is, they don't really move, they bend. And so you have bending type motions of the intervertebral joints. We have this smooth, free moving, gliding type movements of these zygapophyseal joints. Oftentimes there's a concavity, convexity relationship here uh, so that there, there's more articular surfaces present and gives the, the, the more stability to the joint. Intertransverse joints, I mentioned just a while ago to you. I'll come back and show you these. Here's a an aerial view, if you will, of the, of the pelvis of a horse. Here's the ilium, tuber sacrali here, tuber coccyx here, uh, tuber ischii back here. Okay. And here's the sacrum, these few sacral segments. You can't see the wing of the sacrum because it's buried underneath the, the ilium here. But you can see between these transverse processes, these are lumbar vertebra. Okay, this is lumbar spine, obviously thoracic spine with ribs. These are transverse processes of lumbar vertebra. And you chiropractors are looking at these transverse processes going, holy moly, those are great levers. And they are, it's just they're hard to get to because they're deep to the epaxial muscles here, the, the uh, paralumbar muscles, the longissimus muscle that runs right alongside these. But if you notice between these transverse processes, there's a joint. It's actually a joint there. Okay, there's one here off the off the first sacral, the wing of the sacrum, and the last lumbar vertebra here, L6. Okay, here between L5 and L6, there's a joint. Sometimes higher up, but almost always back here. This joint's designed uh, to increase the stability of the low lumbar spine in the horse. Again, this you know, think about the, the the rump, the gluteal muscles of a horse, the hamstrings. It's this this is a powerful animal, and, and this is a very powerful muscular region designed to drive this thousand pound animal forward. Tremendous amount of torque uh, placed on these bones and this this low spine back here. So, it, the stability helps kind of give more of a fulcrum or a, a torque point, if you will, for those muscles to drive off of. 
these joints, these intertransverse joints, may fuse uh, in older adult horses. Uh, something you got to be cognizant of uh, back there when you're adjusting horses uh, back there, especially you know 30, 35 year old horse. Uh, just like just an 80 year old person, you got to be a little more careful because there's lots of those joints are are fused by this time. We'll teach you the adjustments uh, here, Dr. Ennis and Dr. Mar will teach you those adjustments. We talk about the, the, the sacral pelvic adjustments in the horse. Major movement of the lumbosacral spine is flexion extension. There's no supraspinous ligament here, which allows for more flexion extension. The spinous processes of lumbar, lumbar verbal angle cranially. The sacral tubercles angle caudally. So if you look back at this picture right here, you can, I'm sorry, this picture right here, you can see this cranial orientation here. They're angling cranially versus these are more angled caudally. The sacroiliac joint, the joint present between the wings of the sacrum, I'm sorry, yeah, the wings of the sacrum and the ilium, there is a synchondrosis or, or, or fibrocartilage there. Okay, so the there's there is a fibrocartilaginous synchondrosis between the wings of the sacrum and the ilium, and that presents a little bit of a problem because that tends to fuse with age, and that synchondrosis or that primary cartilaginous joint uh, between the wings of the sacrum and the ilium itself can fuse and turn to bone, become a synostosis, which means that in older animals, like in older people. Uh, you probably need to be careful adjusting the sacrum uh, and you'll get to the point that you can't. It will actually fuse and the sacrum becomes part of the of the pelvis and you can't move that sacrum. So it's just something to be you know cognizant of uh, there. Here's a sacroiliac joint of a dog. A sacral base posterior would be a dorsal or posterior fixation of this portion of the sacrum. A sacral apex laterality would be a right or left fixation of this part of the sacrum. So the sacral apex laterality deals with back here. The sacral base posterior deals with up here. On the horse. Here you have the, the tuber sacrali right here, the tuber coccyx here, tuber ischii here. Here's a S2 tubercle. And so this is where you're adjusting the horse for sacral base posterior. Now again, this fuses oftentimes in older horses, this joint, this sacroiliac joint. So you're not going to be moving that sacrum. So sacral base posterior deals with this portion of the sacrum. Sacral apex laterality deals with this portion of the sacrum back here. Pubic symphysis is a secondary cartilaginous joint, just like the intervertebral joint is. Uh, and this, again, sometimes ossifies in older animals. Uh, in a bitch fixing to whelp or a mare fixing to foal, uh, you've got to be concerned about the increased laxity uh, of the pelvis and basically all the joints uh, to the release of the hormones and preparing the body for partuition or birth process. And so uh, think about that when you're adjusting these animals. Some of these joints will be hypermobile. Just threw this in here, you know, for especially you chiropractors who want to know more anatomy and, and get some good pictorial representations. Uh, these are two pretty good books. Color Atlas of Veterinary Anatomy for Dog and Cat and Color At uh, Atlas of Veterinary Anatomy for the Horse. It's by Mosby. Pretty good books. The sacrotuberous ligament uh, is, is an important ligament uh, that we find both in the uh, dogs and the horses. Uh, there is an entire adjustment protocol uh, that deals with this ligament. As a matter of fact, there's an entire chiropractic college uh, based upon adjusting this ligament and other ligaments, uh, and it's called the Logan Basic Technique. Logan Technique puts 
pressure on these ligaments and we'll teach you some of this technique throughout this program this is our primary focus but we will teach some of this throughout the program because it actually helps the spine relax so oftentimes if I have dogs who I just can't get the spine to relax where I can adjust the segments I'll contact sacral tuberous ligament uh, hold it for about 30 seconds 15 to 30 seconds and get that spine to relax and I'll come back and adjust the vertebral segments uh, there's also a technique called BEST technique, bioenergy synchronization technique that contacts the sacral tuberous ligament along with the occiput balancing, balancing the energy fields of the dog. Uh, and again, we'll mention some of that to you as well. So we'll go through this. We'll get some of this uh, to you. Now, you veterinarians uh, hear me say bioenergy synchronization technique and balancing the energy fields of dogs, and you're going, ooh, voodoo. Well, to be honest with you, I, I thought the same thing when I first got into the chiropractic and in, into energy medicine and things such as this, but I think most of the evidence-based research is starting to support the fact that we're dealing with energy fields and we're dealing with energies, and especially in humans, uh, the, the energy fields in, in are, are critically important uh, with treating patients. There's a book by Dr. Kelly Turner. She's a PhD. It's called Radical Remissions. It talks about people who have cured themselves or been cured of, of cancer uh, when they were basically told by uh, their physicians, uh, their doctors, that they were going to die in just a matter of years. And uh, they come back 5, 10, 15 years later are cancer free. And one of the biggest components of these radical remissions is this energy work and, and, and getting the energy of the body right. Uh, so don't close your mind yet. Keep an open mind to things, and um, you know you might you might learn something that you might could use to help on your animal patients later on. So sacral tuberous ligament. Back to this uh, from sacral apex uh, down to ischial tuberosity in the equine. Uh, it forms a border of the greater and lesser sciatic foramina. The greater sciatic foramen obviously is where the sciatic nerve travels through, and it's a attachment point for some muscles, biceps, gluteus medius, and superficialis, uh, and some others, and. It, it's an important ligament. It's easy to palpate. It's right lateral to the rectum of the horse, the, the anus of the horse. And we'll show you this in lab. In the dog, in the horse, it's more of a of a of a sheet, uh, more of a flat sheet. Uh, in the dog, it's a single fibrous cord, uh, kind of like it is in humans, uh, between the sacrum and the tuberitiae or ischial tuberosity. And it's easy to palpate in lab. Uh, be sure and grab one of the instructors and have us show you where this uh, sacral tuberous ligament is. Cats don't have one. Cats got ripped off on a lot of things, but they don't have a sacral tuberous ligament. Uh, so you won't find one in cats. Here is the sacral tuberous ligament of the dog. Pretty easy to palpate. This is actually not a horse. This is actually a cow, but you can see how the sacral tuberous ligament of the ungulates and the, the, the larger animals is more of a sheet. Motion palpation. Uh, we're actually going to go through some specific motion palpation uh, teaching with you. But what you're doing is you're palpating the joint or palpating the vertebra through its normal range of motion and you're trying to feel for areas of increased motion or areas of decreased motion or even fixated joints that are not moving at all. This is basically what the chiropractic subluxation is. One of the concerns and I mentioned this in another lecture series we'll go over but one of the concerns that the chiropractor has uh, and the veterinarian has is that we don't have a clear understanding with each other as to what a subluxation is. To a veterinarian, a subluxation is a loss of normal articular arrangement. In other words, it's a partial lo a dislocation or partial luxation of the joint. Uh, subluxation is we, the articular surfaces are disarranged. They're not uh, in, in normal alignment, if you will. To a chiropractor, a subluxation is, is a little more complicated in that it may be a fixated joint. It may be a hypomobile joint. It may even be a hypermobile joint. But the subluxation is a loss of normal motion of a joint. So there's loss of normal motion. And that's basically what a subluxation is. And so what we are doing 
with the chiropractic adjustment is we're reestablishing motion. We're putting motion back in that vertebral segment or back in that joint. We're removing that fixation, if you will. So typically when we talk about subluxations chiropractically, it's either a joint that's fixated or a joint that's hypomobile. It's not moving like it should be moving. The amount of movement varies between animals, uh, obviously, also between ages of animals, also between what the animal's used for. You know, is the animal an athlete or is the animal a couch potato chip? You know, I mean, it basically, uh, how much mobility is there really varies between the animals. And again, you have got to get used to palpating. The purpose of motion palpation is to take the joint through the normal range of motion. As I said, to look for restricted areas or excessive areas. The animal has to be relaxed to do this. You can't do adequate motion palpation uh, in an animal that's uptight, that's nervous, that's scared to death. Uh, and so you've got to spend time getting the animal to relax to do this. I find that we veterinarians, really because we're used to working with the animals more, uh, can usually motion palpate quicker and earlier on an animal than a chiropractor has. In other words, we're, we're, I think we veterinarians are more at ease with the animals earlier on and the animals become more at ease with us because they know that we pretty much are at ease with them than the chiropractor. So chiropractors work with your animals, work with getting them to relax, work with having them, you know, just allow you to palpate them and so spend time palpating them. Sacral pelvic examination uh, on the equine ilium and we're going to go over this with you uh, as we talk about the different adjusting techniques out there but you want to stand to the side of the horse you want to grab a hold of that tuber coccyx and pull it ventrally just pull it ventrally with both hands you know down pull it downwards you know pull it to you and downwards uh, with both hands uh, push up on it pull down on it push up on it so you're going dorsal ventral with it okay and you're, you're trying to see if it moves and compare both sides. You know, always say God gave us two sides to, so we can compare one versus the other and look for abnormal. And it's true. And, and just compare both sides. And these horses who have, you know, fixations, you can, you can find it pretty easily. One thing you'll notice that if an animal does have a subluxation, typically pulling the bone in the direction of the subluxation or pushing it further into subluxation is going to cause pain. Or if you push it opposite the subluxation or opposite the fixation, it relieves pain. So if you have a horse with a fixated, you know, tuber coccyx, if you will, if you pull in it, say if it's fixated ventrally, if you pull down on it ventrally, it's going to hurt. Or if you push up on it, the horse will lean into you because it feels good. You're pushing it out of out of subluxation. Compare both sides. If there's lack of movement, suspect a fixated sacroiliac joint or a PI or AS ilium. And we'll define these more later on. We're going to show you this in lab. For the equine sacrum, stand on the side of the horse, grasp the apex of the sacrum, which is the caudal part of it again, remember, and pull it laterally. Lack of movement, suspect a fixated sacrum, an apex laterality. And again, as I said earlier, pain is seen when pushing the apex further into subluxation. So if you pull it to you and it feels good, then that's probably the direction you need, the line of correction that you need to move that sacrum. For the canine ilium, stand on the side of the dog, place the heel of the hand on the tuber sacrali, and motion it. Motion in a dorsal ventral direction. It's easy to feel. You can palpate it easily. Lack of movement, suspect the sacroiliac joint fixation. Or again, a PS or AS ilium. Try to notice that depression between the, the adjacent tuber sacrali and where that base of the sacrum is. A loss of that depression oftentimes indicates a sacral base posterior. For the apex, push on it. Push on the apex of the sacrum. Push both directions. See if you get fixation or pain when you do that. For the horse, the horse should be standing on level ground, soft ground, so you can evaluate depth of, of the hoof prints. That's going to give you some indication as to fixations of the pelvis. Look at the pelvic leg length in the horse. Stand back and get the, pel get the horse standing square. Don't let him be resting on one leg or the other, which horses will do. Have the horse stand square and look. If 
that appears that one leg is longer than the other suspect on the long leg side of PI ileum. On the short leg side, suspect of AS ileum. You can tell this oftentimes you walk the horse on in, in, on soft dirt, so we can actually compare. You can see that the depth of the footprint is longer on the affected leg for the long leg. So the footprint's longer. And you'll see that. Now, is it an AS or is it a PI? So is the right leg long or is the left leg short? And that's something you determine by motion palpation. Okay, and we'll teach you to do that in lab. In the canine, it's the same thing. Okay, the long leg is a PI ilium side, the short leg is the AS ilium side. Now, I'll mention this in lab to you, but I will tell you that for about a year, we argued about this. We instructors argued about in the dog, is a long leg the PI ilium or is a short say, leg the PI ilium? Because in humans, you're human chiropractors, and, and right now you're having heartburn hearing this from me, but you human chiropractors know that in humans, if you do deer field leg checks in humans, the short leg's the PI side. So in long, I'm saying long legs PI and quadrupeds, but in humans the short legs the PI side. Now, and you veterinarians right now are going, well, what are you even talking about? Well, hang in there, and we'll we'll discuss it in lab and show you in in lab how, what I'm talking about. But suffice it to say that if you check a quadruped in quadrupedal stance, the PI leg is the long leg. If though you take that dog and grab his legs and extend the pelvis, okay, extend the legs backwards behind him. So now you've taken a quadruped and you converted him into a bipedal stance. So from a quadrupedal stance to a bipedal stance by extending those rear legs, then that PI leg goes short. I always check dogs' legs by extending the legs out behind them. And that's just the way I, I learned to do it and the way I've always done it. So when I, I was first discussing this with instructors from other schools, they would say, no, the PI leg's a long leg. I'd say, no, the PI leg's a short leg, just like in humans. And we argued back and forth until we realized we were looking at them differently. They were evaluating them in quadrupedal stance. I was evaluating them in bipedal stance. So just so you know, and again, grab us in labs and we'll show you this. Some muscles of the sacral pelvic region back here, and, and again, I'm not going to test you on a lot of muscles, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time going over this these muscles, uh, but there are some major muscles back there you need to know about. So as major muscle, obviously, is a very important muscle both in dogs, uh, in horses, and in humans. Uh, it's it's an activated muscle. So as major muscles activated during stress uh, in humans, uh, it, it it's involved in walking, stabilization of pelvis. Uh, it, it's a, it's a critical muscle. It's also a critical muscle uh, in dogs from the aspect of of hip dysplasia, uh, lateral rotation of the thigh, uh, outward swing of the knee. Um, it's just a pretty important muscle, and I, I see a fair number of dogs who present with psoas major uh, muscle spasms uh, and have to get in there and do some muscle stripping and get down deep in that muscle and really work that muscle out. But, but it stabilizes the lumbar spine during flexion of the pelvic limb, also flexes the hip, rotates the limb outward, and flexes the vertebral column. As I said, it is a muscle of activation during times of stress. It's a tension muscle. It's going to uh, lock up and, and tense up during sympathetic reactions. So animals who are stressed, uh, humans who are stressed, have a lot of psoas issues. And you chiropractors know all the problems of pelvic tilt and things like that associated with psoas major spasms. Iliacus muscle is actually from the uh, ilium itself to lesser trochanter to femur. It's going to flex hip, rotate thigh laterally. Dogs with hip problems, dogs with coxofemoral problems, uh, have spasms of the iliacus muscle, oftentimes along with psoas major. You know that iliacus muscle and psoas major muscle blend together uh, below the level of the inguinal ligament, and we call that muscle the iliopsoas. Quadrasum borum, and also very, another, another very important muscle. Uh, basically, it, it comes from the bodies of the last three thoracic vertebrae, transverse processes of lumbar vertebra. And the, meat, and the proximal portion of those last two ribs inserts onto the medial surface of the wing of the ilium. On humans, it's onto the iliac crest. And it's going to flex and stabilize the spine. Again, it's a reactive muscle, tends to lock up, causes a lot of lateral pelvic tilt. 
uh, lateral spinal tilt uh, in both humans and in animals. Gluteus medius, uh, unlike us, gluteus medius is a huge muscle. In humans, it's, it's, it's an important muscle in stabilization of the pelvis, important muscle in walking, uh, it inserts on the greater trochanter uh, in, in humans in, in animals, and it, it's, it, but it's a much larger muscle in animals. Uh, muscle of exceptional size and power. Here's the attachments of this. There is a bursa uh, located associated with this muscle called a trochanteric bursa. And this can become inflamed uh, in horses especially. Uh, you can get inflammation of this trochanteric bursa. Uh, when the animal walks, it tends to swing the limb outward uh, to keep it from coming directly uh, cranially or directly uh, superiorly because of the pain. And they'll, they'll walk with a, a swing in their arch, uh, uh, just uh, swing that leg outward, if you will. But we'll talk about trochanteric bursitis more later on. Gluteus medius, greater, also inserts on greater trochanter or femur. Just know it's there. And here's the gluteus medius. Here's gluteus superficialis. And the dog. Here's tensor fascia lata. Here's the iliotibial tract. Biceps femoris. Here's the equine, gluteus medius and superficialis here. Big muscle. Here's tuber coccyx right here. Here's tensor fascia lata in the horse. You can see the difference here in the horse versus the dog. Hamstring muscles back here. Superficial gluteal, tuber coccyx to the greater trochanter of the femur. Going to abduct the limb, extend the limb. Gluteus medius, gluteus superficialis. I promise you that most veterinarians here, including myself, when I'm working on animals, I'm not trying to name these muscles. I'm just trying to figure out problems and figure out how to fix them. And so I'm not going to be big on test purposes or anything, trying to name a bunch of muscles. As we go through these slides, if there's muscles I want you to know, like the psoas major, uh, in particular, I'll mention those. Gluteus profundus, which profundus means deep. Ischial spine, but greater trochanter femur. So it's, going to, it's an abductor of the thigh. These slides are all in your notes. You can look at them on your own in your notes. Just the horse again. Longissimus dorsi. I, I, I do want to mention this muscle. This this muscle is probably the major extensor of the back. This is in humans one of the erector spinae muscles. Uh, three columns of erector spinae: spinalis, uh, longissimus, and iliocostalis. Uh, the three from medial to lateral uh, of the of the spine. Uh, this muscle originates from the ilium, the sacral tubercles, spinous processes of thoracic and lumbar vertebra, and inserts on spinous processes of thoracic lumbar vertebra, and even up to the neck muscles. This is a huge muscle. It, it's it's the paraspinal muscle. It's it, you can feel this ridge of muscle lateral to the spinous processes of both dogs and horses. It's a major extensor of the back. It maintains stiffness of the back of the horse. In normal curvature of that spine, it's, it's a critical muscle for posture, uh, and you're going to see lots of issues with this, and, and this associated with a lot of pain associated with vertebral uh, subluxations, intervertebral disc disease, things like this. So we'll talk about the longissimus dorsi throughout this program. Piriformis, extend hip, abduct leg. It's a lateral rotator. External abdominal oblique. The abdominal muscles are critical muscles uh, to maintaining posture. Uh, the bow and string model of dealing with the, the, the spinal muscles, the, the, basically if you think of the spine as the bow and the muscles as the string, uh, we talk about the fact of how these got to be balanced. We have to balance the, uh, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about the thoracic, thoracolumbar uh, module. We deal more with the thorax and lumbar spine, but this bow and string model. But you've got to have a balance between the abdominal muscles and this longissimus muscle. If the longissimus muscle is too strong, you get a lordosis. If the abdominal muscles are too too strong, you get a kyphosis. 
and lordosis meaning what you call a swayback horse. A swayback horse would be a horse who had very tight longissimus muscles, but very weakly developed or poorly developed abdominal muscles. I see the same thing in dogs, this swayback appearance, uh, where if you have tight abdominal muscles but weak longissimus or weak back extensors, you get the kyphosis or more of a hunchback look. Now, with weak abdominal muscles like external abdominal oblique, and again, I'm not so concerned about the attachments of these. Uh, I, don't, I just put them here for your reading pleasure if you want them, uh, but I want you to know that they're there, and I want you to get with Dr. Ennis at some point and have him show you his technique uh, for getting animals, uh, horses in particular, uh, to tighten their abdominal muscles. He teaches you ways to teach horses to do sit-ups. Obviously, we can't do sit-ups in dogs and horses, but you can get those abdominal muscles tightened. In dogs, there's a way to do this as well, and we'll talk about it. So here's the external abdominal oblique, critical muscles. So you won't balance with these muscles, with these muscles to maintain normal spinal posture. Internal abdominal obliques deep to the external. Uh, it's just next deep to that. And deep to that uh, is a transverse abdominus. Now the rectus abdominis is along the midline on both sides of the, of the linea alba or white line midline. This is a major flexor of the thoracolumbar region. Again, major muscle for being balanced with the longissimus muscle to maintain normal spinal posture. It does help advance the pelvis during the gallop in the horse. It also compresses abdominal viscera. And again, weak abdominal muscles can contribute to lordosis or that sway back horse. Just showing you here's the internal abdominal oblique, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis up here, which is the deepest of these abdominal muscles. Go back to the slide real quick. There's that longissimus muscle all on there. Tensor fascia lata is on the lateral aspect of the uh, uh, hip joint. Uh, I have a friend of mine who teaches anatomy. He calls this a Starbuck muscle. Tensor, tensor fascia latte. He's going to help the students remember that. It's going to flex the hip, extend stifle from tuber coccyx down to tibia. It touches down on Gertie's tubercle. Sartorius muscle, crescent ilium, ASIS, just like in humans, uh, to the patella and tibial crest. A bit different insertion than in humans. In humans, it are in, inserts along the pes and serenus there on the uh, medial aspect of the tibia. This flex hip extends stifle. Biceps femoris is part of the hamstring muscles. You have three hamstring muscles, the biceps femoris on the lateral side. Then on the medial side, you have the semitendinosus and semimembranosus. So the tendinosus is superficial to the membranosus. All three of these muscles come from the ischial tuberosity. Biceps femoris, sacral tuberous ligament as well. Inserts on femur, patella, and tibia. It will extend and abduct the pelvic limb. It's generated by the sciatic nerve and the, the levels of the spine, the spinal segments, if you will. And by definition, a spinal segment is a cross-sectional area of the spinal cord that gives rise to a single pair of spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves, or the spinal segments, if you will, that form the sciatic nerve and equine are L5, 6, S1, and 2. The dog is L6, 7, S1, and 2. A little different than the humans. Semimembranosus on the medial side also extend and, and this will adduct the pelvic limb because on the medial side. Biceps femoris, here's semitendinosus. And semimembranosus deep to that. Now, the spinal cord, and just go over the spinal cord a little bit. I said we'd come back to this, and we're here now. So, obviously, spinal cord is part of the CNS. Uh, we divide the nervous system anatomically into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Basically, central nervous system is brain and spinal cord, and all the associating supportive cells, the glial cells, the neuroglial cells, the, all the things like the oligodendrocytes and microglial cells, things such as that. And then everything else is peripheral nervous system. So cranial nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. Spinal nerves are part of the peripheral nervous system. So spinal cord is obviously housed within the vertebral column. 
the spinal nerves which exit out the intervertebral foramen are formed by the dorsal roots and the ventral roots. The dorsal root carries sense by, there's a law called the Bell-Mengendi law. Bell-Mengendi law says the dorsal root carries sensory information where the ventral, and please forgive the typo there, it should be ventral not ventra, the ventral root carries motor information. It is the union of this dorsal and ventral root that form the spinal nerve. Spinal cord obviously is a, a, provides the spinal nerves. It, it, it carries information to and from the body, basically. So the spinal, if you imagine the spinal cord is a huge telephone cable that's carrying information to the brain and information from the brain to the body. So you have sensory information coming from the body headed to the brain and motor information from the brain headed out to the body. And that's just a kind of a simplistic way to look at it. It is also a reflex center, spinal reflexes. Spinal reflexes do not require cognitive interpretation uh, as to the spine and back. And you know, we're talking about monosynaptic and uh, bisynaptic reflexes, uh, spinal reflexes. So ascending pathways in the spinal cord carry sensory information. Descending pathways carry motor information. The central nervous system is covered by a, a layer of connective tissue uh, it's called the meninges. Uh, there's three layers of this. The dura mater. Dura mater means tough mother. Uh, this is a very th thick, dense, fibrous connective tissue. Outer layer of the meninges serves to protect uh, the brain and the spinal cord. Uh, deep to that is the arachnoid. The arachnoid refers to spider. It's a very thin, lacy type of layer. Deep to the arachnoid is called the subarachnoid space where the cerebral spinal fluid is. Cerebral spinal fluid is secreted in the ventricles of the brain by the appendable cells. Then deep to that, laying directly on the surface of the brain and directly on the surface of the spinal cord is the tender mother, or pia mater, uh, called, which, which covers directly on the surface. It's a very thin layer. It's the most vascular of the three layers. And there's little small projections of this pia mater that project out laterally and connect to the dura. These are called denticulate ligaments. Denticulate ligaments serve to anchor the spinal cord, if you will, within the dural sac. So if you imagine the dura mater is just a huge sac uh, that surrounds the brain and spinal cord, uh, the, the denticulate ligaments anchor that spinal cord in that dural sac. Just show you a picture here. Here's the spinal cord. This is that outer layer, the dura mater. Then we have the arachnoid. Then we have the cerebral spinal fluid. Then right on the surface of the cord itself is the pia mater. This shows the different roots. Here's the dorsal root. Here's the ventral. They actually the dorsal rootlets, which form the dorsal root. These are ventral rootlets, which form the ventral root. But you can see that these two roots come together to form the spinal nerve. This happens right at the intervertebral foramen. The IVF are pretty darn close to it. So information is coming in the cord this way and going out the cord through these processes. So information is coming in the dorsal root, going out the ventral root. If you look at the brain and spinal cord, there's a grayish or darker colored area. It's called the gray matter, substantia grecia. It's a it's composed mostly of neuron cell bodies, and of course there's processes of neurons, there's dendrite processes, axon processes there, but most of it's neuron cell bodies, and also the glial cells. Glia means glue, and the glial cells are just the supportive cells, things like the astrocytes, uh, which support the neurons, microglial cells, which are uh, phagocytic cells, which eat you know debris and matter and things such as that, that just you know d removed o dead neurons, if you will. Uh, the oligodendrocytes, which are uh, the cells of the CNS that form the myelin sheath of the CNS. They're synonymous with the, or the same thing as the, the neurolimocytes or swan cells in the PNS. So in the peripheral nervous system, swan cells make the myelin sheath. In the central nervous system, it's the oligodendrocytes that make the myelin sheath. And of course, you have the appendable cells. Appendable cells are also uh, glial, uh, glial cells, and they're what makes cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, the gray matter is very rich in capillaries. Not many myelinated axons there, but there are a few. If 
you look at the gray matter, it looks almost butterfly shaped. Uh, there's a dorsal horn uh, in the thoraco, thoraco lumbar, upper lumbar region. There's a lateral horn, and there's also a, a, a ventral horn. The lateral horn is associated with the sympathetic nervous system. The dorsal horn is incoming sensory information. And then the ventral horn or anterior horn is the source of neuron cell bodies for motor neurons. So I don't want to, it's not listed on here, but I would put the ventral horn here as well, or anterior horn as a source of motor neurons, uh, cell bodies. White matter basically consists of a bunch of myelinated axons and tracks. So the, the, the white matter is, again, you'll see oligodendrocytes there. This is the predominance where you find oligodendrocytes because that's where they're, they're making the myelin, the myelin sheath. There are astrocytes here. There's also astrocytes in gray matter. These are supporting the neurons themselves. They do support the neurons. Astrocytes are supportive cells. They're involved in the formation of blood-brain barrier, things such as this. And it's also vascularized. Now, the white matter is a bunch of tracks. Tracks meaning fascicles or bundles of, of axons carrying information to and from the brain and to and from the spinal cord, up and down the spinal cord. And we'll talk about this later on as we go through this. But it's compression of this white matter that causes a lot of the clinical signs and symptoms we see with dogs with herniated disc disease. It is divided into these, these funiculi or bundles if you will. The dorsal funiculus is where dorsal rootlets enter. The ventral funiculus is, is where the axons cross from one side to the other. And then there's a lateral funiculus. And these are just where these columns are. These columns of neurons that run up and down the spinal cord. Along the spinal cord, there's a ventral median fissure, which is a little sulcus, if you will, on the ventral side. There's also a dorsal median fissure along the, the, the dorsal side or back side. And you can see that in this picture right here. Here's those fissures. That's the ventral median fissure right there. And your dorsal median fissures back here. Oh, go back. This is gray matter. You see it kind of looks like a butterfly. So here's your dorsal horn. If this was in the thorac thorax region or thoraco region, this would be your lateral horn. And here's your ventral horn. And ventral horn is a source of neuron cell bias for motor neurons. Your dorsal funiculus, your lateral funiculus, and your ventral funiculus. Spinal cord segments, as I said, a segment, spinal cord segment is a cross-sectional cross -sectional portion of the spinal cord. It gives rise to a pair of spinal nerves. Dogs have eight cervical segments, just like people do, just like horses do. They have 13 thoracic segments, seven lumbar, three sacral, and five coccygeal segments. Each of these segments gives rise to a pair of cranial, excuse me, a pair of spinal nerves. Forgive me, spinal nerves. There's an enlargement in the cervical region, where the brachial plexus arises from. There's also an enlargement in the lumbosacral region, where the lumbosacral plexus arises from. So we have a big clustering of neuron cell bodies in these regions because there's a lot of nerves that come off here, and this is what supplies the nerves to the upper extremity, to the thoracic limb, if you will. Humans, we call it upper extremity. Dogs, horses, could say the thoracic limb. Back here, the lumbosacral region provides the innervation to the pelvic limbs. The conus medullaris is the end of the spinal cord. The spinal cord just tapers to an end. It usually consists of the sacral segments and coccygeal segments. In the dog, the spinal cord, the conus medullaris, the termination of the spinal cord ends around L6, L7 disc. Dogs have seven lumbar vertebra. Humans have five. Okay, so between the L6 and L7 is where the spinal cord ends in dogs. There's a phylum terminale, which is a segment of pia mater that actually 
pierces through the dural sac and attaches onto the coccygeal vertebra and its function is to kind of anchor the cord on the on the posterior or the uh, inferior caudal end okay so it anchors the cord at, at the downside of it here's a picture of a canine uh, here's lumbar vertebra okay here you can see the conus medullaris conus terminalis ending here about between the L6 and L7 disc region here's the cauda equina which travels on into the sacrum and then you can kind of see that little phylum terminale right there that little distal aspect of pia mater. it kind of goes through here it goes through the dural sac on to connect uh, to the coccyx the dural sac encloses the subarachnoid space and cerebral spinal fluid it extends a couple centimeters on beyond the end of the spinal cord, so on caudal to the end of the spinal cord. It's called the lumbar cistern, and here you can do lumbar punctures back there. The cauda equina, the spinal nerve roots distal to the termination of the spinal cord, which in this slide right here, that's, this is all cauda equina. So the cord's ended, but the spinal nerves continue on to exit out between the intervertebral foramen that they're numbered for. At birth, the canine spinal cord extends into the sacrum, but as the animal grows, it shortens some, the vertebrae keep growing, and ends up around L6, L7 in the adult. C1, spinal nerve, exits the vertebral column through a little lateral vertebral foramen in the dorsal arch of the atlas, which is C1 vertebra. C2 through C7 exit through the intervertebral foramina. C8 exits the IVF between C7 vertebra and T1. And from that point, caudally, the nerves exit caudal to or inferior to the vertebra they're numbered for. In the cervical region, they exit a, the cranial or superior to, just like in humans. Spinal nerves, and again, I underline things you may see on test. 36 pair in the dog, 42 in the horse. The spinal nerves form by the junction of the dorsal root and ventral root. Once that union forms, it then branches. This, the branches of the spinal nerve include the meningeal branch, which then turns back into the IVF, innervates structures inside the neural canal. The dorsal branch, or dorsal ramus, which innervates epaxial muscles, muscles of the, of the back, the longissimus muscle, the erector spinae muscles, communicating branch would be found uh, both white and gray in the thoracic region just gray in the cervical region and gray in the lumbar region and we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system here but those communicating branch are carrying autonomic fibers sympathetic fibers then the ventral branch is going to carry which is the nerve you're probably most familiar with the ventral branch what forms most of the uh, peripheral nerves you're familiar with like the radial nerve the median nerve the sciatic nerve uh, this is going to innervate the hip axial muscles or the muscles of the extremities and the muscles of the abdominal wall things such as that so the meningeal branch afferent fibers post that sympathetic fibers supplies the dura mater the dorsal <clears throat> excuse me the dorsal longitudinal ligament, things such as that, and the annulus fibrosus of the intervertebral disc. And the annulus fibrosus are outer layers of the intervertebral disc. So dogs with intervertebral disc disease, uh, it's primarily this branch of the nerve carrying that pain fibers to the spinal column and into the brain. The dorsal branch, I said it innervates the epaxial muscles. Basically, the, those muscles of the back out to the level of about the transverse processes or so. Ventral branch innervates the hip axial muscles, muscle of body wall, muscles of the extremities, the pelvic limb and thoracic limb. It is the largest branch of the four branches. And it's what forms the plexuses, like the brachial plexus and the sacral plexus, things such as that. Communicating branch again carries sympathetic fibers. This will be found in there's gray rami communicantes found throughout the spinal column, but the white rami communicantes are just found in the thoracic region. And that's not really, that's just more, that's more academic than anything. Most spinal nerves exit the, the vertebral canal through the invertebral foramen, which is formed by the pedicles of adjacent vertebra. 
in, in dogs OC1 exits this little foramen right here located on the cranial dorsal aspect of the arch of the atlas. As I said, C2 spinal nerve exits between C1 and C2 vertebra, C8 between C7 and T1. The sacrum is fused into three vertebra. There's two dorsal, two ventral sacral foramina for the passage of these spinal nerves, the sacral spinal nerves. S3 exits between the IVF between the last sacral vertebra and the first coccygeal or caudal vertebra. Most dogs, and, and what do you call them, caudal or coccygeal, I don't care, but most dogs have about 20 of these, about 20 plus caudal or coccygeal vertebra. But only the first five spinal segments or first five actually have caudal nerves that develop. And beyond that, they're vestigial and you really can't find them and they're not really there. The plexuses, the plexuses are the collection of nerve fibers uh, provided by the different spinal segments, different spinal nerves, uh, and these are going to supply the body wall and the appendages, the cranial uh, limb and the caudal limb or the thoracic limb and, and pelvic limb, and this is what forms the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, and the lumbosacral plexus. We'll talk about the plexuses as we go through this program. Dermatones, by definition of dermatones, an area of skin innervated by a single spinal nerve or by a single pair of a spinal nerves, single spinal segment. A lot of overlap here. Uh, we'll use dermatones throughout the course to test uh, for integrity of certain spinal nerves, certain spinal segments. Myotomes, by definition, is a muscle innervated by a single spinal nerve. If you go back to embryo, and I know we all hate embryo, but if you go back to embryo, there's a structure called a dermatomyotome, develops from the somites. So the developing embryo, the somites develop a dermatomyotome, which is a big cluster of cells, develops right around the spot, what's called the neural tube in those days, and it basically develops this area that becomes a dermatome and myotome. So there's a very close association between the neural tube and what projects out of the neural tube, which is basically are, are the, the sensory and motor neurons, uh, motor neurons coming from the neural tube, uh, sensory neurons coming more from neural crest cells, but they come from those areas and they are associated. So uh, there's a close association between, between dermatomes and myotomes, and this helps us identify certain spinal segments involved with subluxations. Sacral nerves in the canine, uh, as far as sacral nerves go, spinal segments S1, 2, 3 form part of the conus medullaris. Dorsal branches go back to exit the, the, the and exit to innervate the apaxial muscles. Here's showing you the sacral segments here. S1, 2, 3 right here, and here's the coccygeal segments right here. It's helpful to know the nerve roots that form the peripheral nerves because that's going to help you identify areas of subluxation. And spinal segments that innervate specific and nerves that innervate specific muscles, again, helpful for spining, spining subluxations. Uh, there's a procedure called applied kinesiology in which we do muscle testing, which we test muscles to determine areas of subluxation. And that's why it's important to understand the association of these nerve roots with the spinal segments and with the muscles and with the dermatomes. Dorsal branches of sacral nerves form the dorsal sacral plexus, give off medial and lateral branches. The ventral branches of sacral nerves uh, form the sacral plexus. And the last five lumbar nerves join with those that form the lumbosacral plexus. Shows you the sacrum lumbar spine of the dog. Here's, these, here's the IVF. Here's this lumbosacral plexus. Okay. And you can see these nerves, and you've heard of these nerves the sciatic nerve, the obturator nerve, the caudal gluteal nerve, the caudal rectal nerve. But we know what happens if you cut that, don't we, docs? And your chiropractors are saying, what, what? We'll ask the, the veterinarians, if they respond with veterinarians, you cut that colorectal nerve, the issues it can cause, or we'll get to it in a second. Lumbosacral trunk, largest, most important part of the lumbos, uh, lumbosacral plexus, it's L6 and L7, uh, mostly in dogs, sometimes uh, S1, and sometimes S2, mostly L6 and L7, but this becomes a sciatic nerve. 
The sac nerve is a critical nerve in dogs, just like in people, just like in horses as well. So we have L6, L7, S1, and there's that lumbosacral trunk. And here you can see it goes there to form the sciatic nerve, which then becomes the peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. Cranial gluteal nerve comes from the lumbosacral trunk, supplies the deep and middle gluteal muscles and also tensor fasciae There's no cutaneous nerves for that nerve. Caudal gluteal nerve uh, from the lumbosacral trunk as well, mostly L7, uh, supplies the superficial gluteal muscle. And again, there's no real cutaneous branches of that nerve. But that's kind of true in humans too, about the inferior gluteal nerve anyway. Pelvic nerves, pelvic splanchnic nerves, uh, S1 and S2. Uh, these are preganglionic parasympathetic neurons. Now, interesting research done about a year ago came out by a group of researchers, and they said that S1, S2 spinal segments give rise to these what are called pelvic splanchnic nerves or nervi erigentis, and that these very probably are really sympathetic nerves instead of parasympathetic nerves, and so got a big debate in the academic community about my gosh we were taught for years that the you know the parasympathetic is craniosacral versus sympathetic is thoracolumbar and what it boils down to is that these are spinal nerves and so yes they are different than the parasympathetic cranial nerves but functionally they are parasympathetic nerves so I don't get much into that anatomic argument if you want to discuss the the aspects of it let me know but I don't Put much credence in it. So this this supplies the the pelvic viscera, okay, the urinary bladder, erectile tissue, things like that. This is why when you work on the pelvis of these dogs with urinary incontinence, you can affect that urinary incontinence. Pudendal nerve, pudendal nerve is going to supply the external genitalia uh, and the the sensory area uh, around that region. OS one two three uh, is the formation of the pudendal nerve. Again, underlying things that are important. Colorectal nerve, I mentioned this just a while ago to you. Uh, it arises from the pudendal nerve. It supplies the external uh, anal sphincter. And in dogs who have anal gland problems, anal gland infections, and in veterinarians go out there and remove the anal glands, that colorectal nerve runs right by those anal glands. And if you're not careful and you cut that nerve, uh, you could have a dog who has fecal incontinence, which means they're leaking feces. And clients don't appreciate that at all. So uh, you got to be very careful. So that's the significance of it. Perineal nerves, uh, these are going to innervate the external urethral sphincter, uh, which is important because, again, dogs with herniated disc disease uh, sometimes will have uh, urinary incontinence uh, associated with this. Muscular branches, mainly from S2, uh, usually two back there in the sacral region, okay, for levator A9, coccygeous muscles. One branch does supply rotators of the hip. The sciatic nerve, and, and a very important nerve, is the largest nerve in the body. Uh, it's a critical nerve. It arises from L6, L7, S1, S2 in the dog. It's a continuation of that lumbosacral trunk. I showed you a picture just a while ago of it. It consists of two nerves, the tibial nerve and common peroneal nerve. You may have learned it's common fibular nerve. And perone means fibula in Greek, so it's the same thing. It supplies the caudal thigh muscles, the hamstring muscles. L6, L7, S1, S2, I got it bolded, you're going to see it again, hamstring muscles, uh, back there, problems with sciatic nerve, you see uh, severe gait dysfunction, they're going to knuckle the paw, uh, the animal can bear weight on the limb because of the femoral nerve being intact, okay, but you're going to lose the extension of the hip, uh, loss of flexion, extension of the hock, again, not loss, but loss, uh, and loss of cutaneous sensation distal to the stifle except for areas innervated by the saphenous nerve. And again, you might remember from your anatomy, the saphenous nerve comes off the femoral nerve, uh, so that's not going to be affected by loss of sciatic nerve. And you're going to have an absence of withdrawal reflex. The animal can't withdraw the limb when you pinch the toes. Tibial nerve, L6, 7, S1, S2. Uh, motor to gastrox, uh, the muscles of the posterior leg, or caudal, uh, caudal leg. If you have problems here, the hock is dropped. The animal can't extend the, can't plant or flex the hock. Common peroneal nerve. Uh, here, the the common peroneal nerve is derived male 6, 7, S1, 2. The 
Paul tends to knuckle here. If you have dysfunction here, there's also a sensation on the cranial surface of the limb, distal to the stifle, so the basically the top of the foot. Uh, poor hot flexion on withdrawal. Uh, we talk about common peroneal nerve dysfunction in, in peroneus tertius muscle uh, in horses later on. Reflexes. Uh, this is important uh, in testing animals for neural integrity. Uh, Neuro, neuro exams on neuro exams on horses and dogs, especially on on dogs, is critical to isolating lesions in the dog. Withdrawal reflex of sciatic nerve is testing the L6 through S1 spinal segments. Patellar reflex, which I think is the most important reflex back here, we test is testing quadriceps femoral nerve, L4 5 spinal segments primarily in the dog. In perineal reflex, we're looking for anal sphincter. Again, we're doing the quadriceps reflex, patellar reflex. We're testing femoral nerve, L4-5 segments primarily. This is the knee jerk reflex. And I think that's the most important reflex. In perineal reflex, I'm sorry, is the external anal sphincter. You're testing back there uh, for pudendal nerve, S1, S2 spinal segments. And you're just what you're doing is you're pinching right beside uh, the rectum to see if they can tighten the rectum. Uh, and it's just they'll, if you, usually if you pinch right beside, they'll tighten that rectum. Also, if you pick up the tail, the, the rectum should maintain closure. It shouldn't become open and flaccid. A lot of these herniated disc dogs have severe herniations, and it's a, it's a bad prognostic indicator, in my opinion. I will have a flaccid anus and have an open anus and, and damage these nerves, so something to, to check. Caudal nerves, not much I do with those. They're there for your reading pleasure. The sciatic nerve in the horse, L6, S1, S2. It leaves the pelvis by the greater sciatic foramen, travels over the sacral sciatic ligament down the caudal aspect of the hip and thigh. Proximal to the stifle, just like in humans and dogs, is going to separate the common peroneal and tibial nerves. Sciatic nerve damage involves the hamstrings and leg muscles. Loss of sensation below the stifle, the animal still can bear weight because of the femoral nerve and quadriceps. Okay, so they still can bear weight there. This picture shows you here is the equine, and here shows you the formation of sciatic nerve, and how it divides into the tibial and the common peroneal nerve. Here's the equine lumbosacral plexus, sciatic nerve here, branches of common peroneal tibial nerve. We're going to cover the femoral saphenous obturator nerve, femoral plexus, when we cover the lumbar spine, spine later on. So we'll come back and cover that later on. Peroneal nerve, uh, extensor muscles of the hoof. Damage results in the inability to actively extend the hoof. And so the hoof will rest on its dorsal, dorsal surface. What we call a proprioceptive deficit in dogs, if you're testing dogs knuckling. We call it knuckling in dogs. Uh, the horse is going to rest on that dorsal surface of the hoof. So it's kind of like radial limb paralysis in the forelimb where they cannot extend the, the hoof or extend the, 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 the paw, if you will, if it's a dog. Animals compensate for this just like people compensate for it by flipping the foot forward. They swing it forward and they put it on the ground and they, they slam it on the ground. So they, they do that to, to be able to walk on the, on the limb. Tibial nerve, tibial nerve between the two heads of the gastrox. Divides into medial lateral plantar nerves just about the level of the calcaneus or level of the hock. Damage this nerve, you'll see sagging of the hock because of loss of gastroc. Uh, they'll sag down. They can't, they can't plantar flex that hock. They can't flex the distal joints. And there's a lot of sensory deficit down the posterior leg. Now, I know this was covered fast, and there was a lot of material here. You need to read over this uh, in time. Uh, please ask questions in lab. Ask questions of instructors. Ask questions of me. If you have any questions about this material, uh, primarily as you go over these nerves, you're testing these nerves to try to determine spinal subluxations, areas of spinal involvement. Uh, spinal subluxations can affect nerve function and then affect myotomes and dermatomes and then muscle function. Uh, so you're using all this information to try to determine where the subluxations are. The single biggest problem the veterinarian has in this course and in chiropractic in general is finding the subluxations. Fixing it is pretty easy. Finding it is what's difficult. So 
just know that now. Practice, practice, practice. Talk to your chiropractic brethren uh, and sisterins, if that's a word, uh, that are here in our program. And uh, get them to help you with this because they can help you find these lesions, okay, and find these these areas of subluxation. Uh, you veterinarians help the chiropractors in palpating these vertebrae of the dogs and horses. Uh, help them where they are, how to palpate them, help them hold the animals, help them handle the animals. Uh, they're nice to doing that. So you two guys are, you work together together as teams uh, the veterinarians and the chiropractors work together to complement each other and and to support each other's weaknesses if you have any questions let me know 